On February 17th at 3 a.m., a Union brigade was finally ferried across the river and with daylight began advancing on Columbia under the command of Colonel George Stone. The morning was bright and beautiful, but the soldiers were water-soaked and muddied, having neither sleep nor breakfast. Engineers immediately began laying pontoons for a bridge, while Generals Sherman, Howard, Blair, Logan, and Hazen watched from a high bluff. At 10 o'clock, just as the pontoon bridge was being completed, the city's mayor and several other prominent citizens met Colonel Stone outside the city to surrender Columbia. They received assurances that the city would be unharmed, a promise later reaffirmed by Sherman with the exception of some public government buildings. At 10.30, Sherman led the rest of his occupying force across the bridge and headed straight for the city. At 11 a.m., as Stone's leading brigade entered Columbia on its main street, the last of Hampton's men departed, leaving a defenseless city of women, children, and old men. All the stores in Columbia, some of which had been looted by Confederate soldiers the previous night, were closely built up for one mile down the city's main street, which leads to the old Capitol building and the new one under construction beside it. Bales of cotton were placed down the middle of Main Street by Confederate forces in anticipation of an order to burn them so as to keep the cotton out of Union hands. While the order never came, some bales were reported smoldering or on fire as Sherman's troops entered the city. These were quickly controlled by Columbia residents. There were no fires of significance when the city was surrendered. The stars and stripes were raised over the State House dome and on top of the uncompleted State House while a heavy detail of men was placed on patrol duty. We have conquered and occupy the capital of the haughty state that instigated and forced forward the treason which has brought on this desolating war. The city which was to have been the capital of the Confederacy if Lee and the rebel hosts had been driven from Richmond is now overrun by northern soldiers. Major George Ward Nichols. David P. Cunningham, Union Army correspondent for the New York Herald, described Columbia. It was famed for its fine public buildings, its magnificent private residences with their lovely flower gardens which savored of oriental ease and luxury. It's hard to conceive of a city more beautifully situated or more gorgeously embellished with splendidly shaded walks and drives, with flowers, shrubberies, plantations. Most of its stores and public buildings were of brick, while most of the private residences were framed, neatly painted, with piazzas hanging with plants and creepers, unsurpassed in the elegance of their finish, the beauty of their grounds, and the luxury seemed to pervade the place. Cunningham witnessed Sherman's entrance into Columbia. General Sherman, accompanied by several other generals, their staffs and orderlies, forming a brilliant cavalcade, rode into the city amidst the scene of the most enthusiastic excitement. Ladies crowded the windows and balconies, waving banners and handkerchiefs. Negroes were grouped along the streets, cheering, singing, and dancing in the wild exuberance of their newborn freedom. Ringing cheers and shouts echoed far and wide, mingled with the martial music of the bands as they played Hail Columbia, Yankee Doodle, and other national airs. It was, indeed, an exciting scene. The discipline of the soldiers upon their first entry into the city was perfect and most admirable. There was no disorder or irregularity on the line of march, showing that their officers had them completely in hand. They were a fine-looking body of men, mostly young and of vigorous formation, well-clad and shod, seemingly wanting for nothing. But if the entrance into town and while on duty was indicative of admirable drill and discipline, such ceased to be the case the moment the troops were dismissed. Columbia resident James Gibbs. This city was full of whiskey and wine, and the colored people who swarmed the streets set it out on the sidewalks by the barrel with the heads knocked in and tin cups provided. Bottles and demijohns were passed liberally to the troops passing through the city to camp quarters. Private John C. Arbuckle. As General Howard, whose troops were in charge of the city, established headquarters in a house near the university and went to sleep, General Sherman occupied a house not far away on the east side of town. Both were some distance from the troops who had taken over the streets of the city. 
Until now, Columbia residents had hoped that their fate would be much like Savannah's, where there had been no great destruction of personal property. That hope quickly faded in the afternoon hours. Our first trouble came about an hour after the entrance, when two horsemen rode into the yard and came into the house, saying they had come to look for arms. They ransacked the house and helped themselves to all the small things they fancied. At last they rode off, assuring us that they would call again. Harriet H. Ravenel About 2 to 3 p.m., the soldiers began breaking into the stores and banks. The plunder and destruction of valuable property was beyond description. I was passing the Bank of Charleston and the Commercial Bank of Columbia and found a squad of about 50 soldiers breaking them open and loading themselves with silver to the extent of their ability to carry. Every store in the city was sacked. There was a marked air of absence from all restraint and control. James Gibbs Out of fear for their property, Residents began requesting Union guards for their homes, and many were granted their requests. Even the Ursuline convent on Main Street, after repeated personal assurances of safety by Sherman, and just as adamant warnings of doom by Union soldiers, finally requested and received guards from the general. Although neither Sherman nor his officers issued orders for the firing of the city, some Union soldiers warned residents that Columbia would be burned, and even described how rockets would signal for the destruction to begin. Towards night, crowds of our escaped prisoners, soldiers, and Negroes were parading the streets in groups. David Cunningham. 